Well, today I'm gonna to talk to you around this idea of mind matters. What's going on in, in your mind, it matters because you, the Bible says, be careful how you think because your life, it follows your thoughts. See, you're gonna have lots of thoughts in your life. You're gonna have thoughts that could cause you to end up in prison. Come on, someone, if you acted on them. You're gonna have thoughts that could, uh, uh, that could improve a relationship, could wreck a relationship. You're gonna have all kinds of thoughts, but accepted thoughts, ones that you accept, they get into your spirit. What you allow into your spirit, well, that's the words that come out of your mouth that ultimately create your world. So your mind matters. That's why in Philippians chapter two, verse five, and I'll talk about it here today, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we're going to get to that in a few moments, but let me read to you. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so uh, next week, everybody say next week. Our campus pastors are going to teach on Philippians 4, 8, the filter that we use of what to think about. And so we're not going to cover the whole uh, book of Philippians, but just two thoughts from it. Uh, it was written by the Apostle Paul from prison, and he was full of joy. It was a book saying you can have joy in any circumstance. And so what I want to do is I'm going to set this up, and it's going to get a little heavy today, and you may not like it, but I'm concerned about your soul. And so everybody just buckle in your seatbelt, and I think my job is to make sure with everything that I can that you end up in heaven, and that you're a person of the word, not a person of the world. Come on, somebody. And so we're going to talk about some of these issues today. So let's talk, let's keep it a little bit light, and then we'll go on from there. Have you ever made a decision before, thought a thought, and decided to act on it that you shouldn't have? Come on, how many of you say that's me? Okay, everybody else is literally Jesus. Okay. I'll never forget, I mean, I remember I broke up with this girl on her birthday. <laughs> Thankfully, she still married me. That was a bad decision. <laughs> Right there. She's a very forgiving and amazing woman. I remember thinking about one day I want to be a pro wrestler. I am so glad I did not act on that thought. Come on. If you look at me, you're like, you could be one of those annoying little managers, right? Anyway, I was voted most likely to become a pro wrestler in the third grade. I was this close. I remember uh, the second time I almost got kicked out of Bible college. I, uh, I, not because I did immoral uh, things, I did uh, accidental, uh, like, I accidentally overdid things. I'm a passionate person, so I have a tendency to do that from time to time. And I love good pranks, but I could never, like, just, I always kind of, like, here's the line, and we kind of leapt over it right over there. And, and, and then one day we decided, well, we were bored. There was a, there was a formal, kind of like a prom that was going on at our college, and, and me and a bunch of the guys didn't go. And so we just said, you know what, what should we do? And someone said, I know what we should do. We should break into that abandoned building. Now, you got to understand, where I went to college, it was Valley For the old Valley Forge General Hospital. And so there's military. There's all these abandoned buildings that we would go in from time to time. And so he said, I, we need to break in. And, and another guy said, yeah, well, what, let's get all the mattresses, the old mattresses, out of the old building. We'll put them, like 50 or 60 of them, we'll stack them in between the two buildings, and then we'll go up on the second floor from the roof of the dorm, and we'll do roof jumping. And we're all like, that's an awesome idea. And so that's what we did that night. We put on music. We got all hype. We got, we were recruiting people. Come on, don't be a baby. Don't be a sissy. Come on, we're going to do it. We're going to jump. And, and I thought about it later when I was sitting before the judicial council and they were asking me why I should allow them to be allowed to stay in college from breaking and entering and all those different things. I thought about it. I said, you know what? Uh, as I think about it, those are old mattresses with like sharp coils that could have, like, as I jumped from the roof and others, could have caused some issues, could have penetrated the skin, could have, could have lost an eye or lost a life, or you know, it just was not a good decision. Come on, how many of you remember those times in your life? Wasn't it, if you could go back, you'd like, I, I would have did it a little bit different. So uh, I'm going to set this up uh, with this, Matthew chapter 16. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, <laughs> which is pretty arrogant if you think about it. Hey, God, you're wrong. 
We live in that culture, by the way, and we'll be going all the way there in a few moments. Um, But he rebuked and said, never, never, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus, like, it's good. Chick-fil-A is open on Sundays. If I'm sick, you can heal me. There's no, I mean, no persecution. We're loving it. We're like a traveling party. It's amazing. That's not going to happen to you. And if we're not careful, we can be just like, just like Peter, following Jesus until it intersects with uh, harming our convenience or our opinion. And Jesus looked at him and, uh, and he said this, and I would encourage you never to say this to your spouse. He said, get behind me, Satan. You know your relationship's going next level when you call that person the devil. Come on, isn't that true? I mean, that's, that's and so Jesus is like, hey, get, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Because you do not have in mind, everybody say mine. Mine on my money and my money on my. Thank you. Okay. (laughs) You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You don't care about the things of God. You only care about yourself. You need to change your thinking. Then Jesus said to his disciples, just to follow, follow it up, and they really make it tough. He didn't, he didn't like, like, well, it's all good, man. Like, whatever you want to believe, whatever you want to think, whatever mind you want to, it's all, no, no big deal. We just love everybody. Love your neighbor. That's the carte blanche religious woke statement for all the decadence of our culture that you shouldn't have an opinion on things that God does, as we'll talk about in a moment. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. So Jesus is like, listen, you're going to have to make some decisions. Now, I have a responsibility. I'll stand before God for teaching you the full counsel of the Word of God and to talk about the issues of the day that have the potential to deceive you, destroy you, and keep you from the kingdom of heaven. So I want to talk about, for a few moments, the mind of culture, and I want to contrast it with the mind of Christ that we see in Philippians chapter 2, and we'll go there in a few few moments. So, So are you ready? So here's a perfect example of the mind of culture. I'm going to bring up this picture. The mind of culture. If social media were in Jesus' time, local carpenter with extremist views continues to spread disinformation deemed harmful by the religious experts. Come on, how many of you know that's true? I mean, that's the kind of culture that we live in. Uh, the culture of, of, of each of these things like, hey, you can have an opinion as long as it doesn't offend someone else. But you need to know that God's word is offensive to the natural mind, the ungenerate mind, to uh, the minds we're going to talk about over these next few moments. So I want to read to you from a scripture that in the future will, will not be permitted to read on social media, and there'll be other issues as a result. And it's found in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. It says this, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And then they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Everybody say confused. confused. Come on, a little bit louder. Center County, join us. Everybody say confused. confused. Their minds became dark and confused. Now, confusion is the seed of deception. The enemy will always say, did God really say that? Instead of asking the question, what did God say? So I can live according to that. The goal is, is regardless of what God says, that we can recreate him in our image so we can live out and do whatever we want to do. The Bible says their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise. We see that all through academia today. Instead, they became utter fools. Instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people, birds, animals, and reptiles. Verse 24. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. They, They knew what was true, but they decided they were going to lie about it. Yesterday, I uh, was watching, and I had my kids watch. You may not like this, and this may bother you, but I'm totally fine with it. I watched a documentary called What is a Woman by a guy named Matt Walsh. A lot of people say, oh, he's a white ring, crazy person. But what he did is he went around, and he asked people, what is a woman? Because in our 
cultural uh, uh, Kool-Aid of the day and critical gender theory, there's no answer to that. It's whatever you want it to be. And so it went round and round. It was really uh, ridiculous, but it's where we are today in our culture, and it's coming fast, and you need to have an opinion on it. And my challenge is that you have God's opinion on it because that's really loving. Encouraging people straight to hell isn't loving. It's cowardice, and you'll be judged for it. God wants you and I to have the truth that could set people free and to love them enough to even disagree. My daughter looked at me, and she said, Dad. And she's just 12. She's 12, right? Yeah. <laughs> She told us, he said, Dad, they don't really believe that. I said, you're right. They don't, but they've chosen to exchange the truth of God and what everyone knows for a lie. So let's continue. Everybody say, I love the little preacher. I think he's a sweet little man. Okay. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. And that is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, Paul said, all men know the truth, but they said, uh, because they want to do their own thing, they suppress the truth uh, that everyone realizes and everyone uh, sees in front of them. He says, since they fall, thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking, and he let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, gossip. They're backstabber, backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. And they invent new ways of sinning. Let me give you an example of one of the new ways, if, as far as I'm concerned, of sinning. One of the things that's popular in our day, it's odd, but it's being pushed all over our, our culture and our country. And you and I need to have God's opinion and we need to push back. And that's Drag Queen Story Hour. If you don't know what that is, it's basically uh, public events that are being held at schools. One well, not too far from here did it. Uh, at public libraries and where they're encouraging to bring their children and uh, that man will dress up as a flamboyant woman, dance around like a stripper, and then read stories to the kids. Literally, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, yesterday, it made the national news, and they shut it down. They didn't shut it down for the reason that you're thinking. It was in Texas, and they were having a uh, drag queen story hour and dance. Bring your family, bring your kids. And parents were there celebrating clapping with their children in a bar, and you can watch the video, it all got leaked and, really, and, uh, and released, and just full-on perversion. The reason it got shut down is not because it was sexualizing children, which is the reason it should have been, but because the children were in a bar. We live in, the, in a day of outreach. And some people are saying, well, Sam, that's just a small example and all those things. And I come to you today, and as I share these thoughts with you, you may not want to engage, and you may want to shut down, and it's just too much for me. And I just want to let you know, God loves you, and he's for you. But he's not just for you. He wants to save other people, and he saves them when they turn from their sins just like you. And how will they know of their sin and the gospel and the goodness unless someone is sent and has the courage and the authority of God to declare the truth of God. You don't have a permission from God to sit this one out. You've been called by him in this day, in this hour, to have the mind of Christ. It goes on to say they disobey their parents, they refuse to understand, they break their promises, are heartless, they have no mercy, they know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them as well. So the mind of culture is three things. It's a mind that's proud. James 4, 6, and 7 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know, in, uh, in the Old Testament, in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar put out a decree that everyone should bow. Now, when they play the music, everyone's to worship this graven image. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we can't do it. We can't worship that image. They said, no, no, you have to do it. Well, we just don't believe the same way. I mean, you can do whatever you want to do. We just don't believe that way. We don't, we don't want to bow. And they said, no, 
you're going to bow or you're going to be thrown into fiery furnace. The spirit of Babylon, the Antichrist spirit, is alive and well in every culture. And it's alive and well today. And we see in something called Pride Month, and let me be real specific on this. So you want, is he saying that? Yes, I want to say all of it right now, and I want you to hear it and be clear with it. Christians should not celebrate Pride Month. Well, you say, well, Sam, you got to understand, it's because they've been marginalized, they've been all these different things. Listen, we should be the first people. If a drag queen comes to our church, they are welcome. If someone that's in the LGBTQ, plus, plus, whatever the alphabet soup, letter of the day, and all these things, they are welcome to come to hear the goodness and the mercy of God. But you and I are not welcome to stay the way that we are. You're not welcome to stay in your adultery and think that God's good with it because you, you have made a decision to exchange the truth of God for a lie. Hey, you can't keep downloading porn thinking God's good with it because, you know, it's just grace and we just love everybody and all these things. Listen, the enemy wants you to bow to the God of this age. You, you're not permitted to be an ally, affirming, celebrating, attacking, or ostracizing someone that has a completely uh, a view that's against the clear teaching of God's word. You are called to care and to confront. See, pride in our culture is about normalizing sexual behavior. That's in opposition to the word of God, human flourishing, and the changing of all social norms. The focus is redefining family and acceptable sexual behavior and shaming those who disagree. God hates pride, or the, uh, and he resists the proud. Of every, uh, of every instance, whether it's religious pride or anti-religious pride. Satan was kicked out of heaven because of it. Pride is about God's creation claiming to know better than him. Now, the gospel isn't about being yourself, loving yourself, accepting yourself. It's about denying yourself. It's not about your self-discovery. It's about your self-denial. God designed creation, and he designed you. And the arrogance of man is that, God, you created me, but I'm going to recreate me, and I can do and be whatever I want to do. See, pride is about God's creation claiming to be the creator. The narcissistic LGBTQ++ religion of sex and self-love and worship is an expression that's being sold to a generation to change everything that goes against Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, and the clear teaching of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. If they can't escape the womb in this anti-life culture where 63 million children are aborted uh, under the uh, culture of convenience, they're manipulated to establish a narcissistic sex and self-worship where they see themselves supreme to God, they can be whatever they want to be. In this religion, you can't choose who to love, but you can choose your gender. You can't control your passions, but you can control uh, what sex you're going to be. You can love anything and anyone without boundaries, without restrictions, because love is love. And the Bible is seen as racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, white men, Christian nationalist, blah, 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 blah. I just want to say that regardless of the, of the mind of pride that wars against God, just like Paul said, you and I are called to turn from our sins and come to the grace of God. I've taught my kids I said, listen, you're going to be attracted to lots of things in life that you shouldn't be. You're going to, attracted to, to be attracted to other people's spouses. You're going to be attracted to uh, maybe same sex. You're going to be attracted to all these different things. You don't have to obey your attractions. You don't have to follow your feelings. But the Bible says you can take up your cross and you can follow Jesus and ultimately you'll find freedom. In a culture that has thrown off the truth of God, it's the most depressed, suicidal, drug-addicted, medicated culture in the history of humanity. The, the mind of pride is not doing what it says it will do. It cannot deliver what only God can deliver. And that's forgiveness and freedom. And then there's the permissive mind. That's the mind, 1 Timothy 4, 1, uh, 2 says. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly, clearly that in these last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They'll follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites. They're liars and their consciences are dead. Revelation 2.20 says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that, women, that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality. I gave an example of this just a few weeks ago. I throw it up on my stories, and uh, you can check them out. They may bother you, but that's the intent. 
drag queen show for kids to be hosted at Florida Church alongside of gender dysphoria class. There's literally a woke church in Naples that is celebrating the confusion of children, ultimately pushing them to get uh, life-altering procedures and chemicals that will destroy them, will injure them, but it's being celebrated by the most evil among us. Progressive woke churches and Christians, they create a Christ from culture rather than creating the culture from Christ. Woke Christianity is a modern-day heresy, or progressive Christianity that has no sin, no conviction, no hell. It embraces all sexual perversion, destruction of marriage, family, and gender under the guise of love. Babies get murdered by the millions under the name of women's rights and justice. It's a lie. It's the doctrine of demons, and God calls us to to turn from it, not to give in to it. It's the mind. You can clap if you want. If you don't, that's fine. It's a permissive mind. Next week will be easier to clap and thoughts and all these things. But if you don't get this right, then you're lost. The next one is the perverted mind. And Jude 1, 7, it says, don't, don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire, and they serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. I think what needs to happen in our day and our hours, we need to redeem the rainbow. People don't know what it means. In fact, uh, if this movement would have taken it from any other uh, religion, there would have been a very different outcome because we're a religion of peace and love and overlooking offense. But the Bible talks about the rainbow. What does it have to say about that? Well, it's very different than what culture's promoting. Genesis 9 says, I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. And when I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds and I'll remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the floodwaters destroy all life. When I see the rainbow in the clouds, I'll remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. Then God said to Noah, this rainbow is the sign of the covenant I'm confirming with all creatures on the earth. That rainbow was a symbol and a picture and a reminder that God keeps his promises. He's a promise keeping God. The promises of God are yes and amen. Now, I preach that primarily as a positive, but even what I'm going to share now is a positive, but it's perceived as a negative. God said, I will never destroy the earth again by water. I promise. But don't forget I did destroy the earth by water because of their perversion. But I promise that rainbow is not only a promise of what I won't do, it's also a promise, as I'll read in a few moments, of what I will do. Last time I destroyed the earth, it was by water. The next time I do it, it will be by fire. Our God is a consuming fire. The reality is is that Sodom had no Bible. We see echoes of that uh, here today. Here's one I posted not too long ago. an article that got some traction. Pride parades and the pride festivals that follow are noisy. They're crowded. They're filled with sights that may be new to kids, like public nudity and kink. So is it appropriate to take your young kids to pride? Well, yes, you should take your kids to pride parade, but have these conversations first. There is a refusal of Christians to acknowledge the truth of God because they have more human concerns like Peter than the mind of, rather than the mind of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, above all, everybody say above all. Above. It says above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers are going to come. Trolls are going to come. You're going to be mocked. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be persecuted. Well, it's because you weren't very nice. No, it's because uh, you're saying what God says. And God says, you can't worship yourself. You can't serve yourself. You need to humble yourself, repent of your sin, and follow me. It says, in the last day, scoffers will come following their own evil desires. They'll say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on and on since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that not long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being. The earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly, just as I mentioned a few moments ago. The mind of culture and of this world is a mind that is proud. It's a mind of pride. 
It's the mind of permissive. It's no big deal. Love is love. Whatever you want to do, you know, we just love people straight to hell. And it's the mind that, excuse me, it's a mind that is, uh, what's that? Thank you. It's a mind that's perverted. So heavy stuff, lots of thoughts. You're like, I'm so glad I came today. If there will be a revival in these last days, and I believe there will, it will not be a revival of great services and emotionalism. It will be a revival of the fear of the Lord and a return to the word of God. A recent study came out, it was not surprising, that less than 40% of pastors hold to a Christian worldview. The people teaching the people in church today do not hold to a Christian view of the world. Many of them are woke, progressive. They erase these parts of the scripture and they try to curry favor with whatever the hashtag movement of the day is. They're bankrupt. They're false prophets. People say, well, Sam, you gotta understand. The times have changed. When, when Paul wrote that, when Paul wrote that, he wrote to the Roman church. And in this culture, the Greeks had so influenced them that homosexuality was the norm and that young boys were encouraged to lose their virginity with men. Culture and times haven't changed. They've just gotten progressively worse throughout our time. He knew what he was saying. As rates continue, those that are sexually active, under, uh, by the time they are 25 years of, old, uh, years of age, more than 50% will have a sexually transmitted disease. It's a really big deal. It's destroying, it's empty, it's lying to a whole generation. And we have not talked about it enough. The world is discipling the next generation. And we said, you know what? That's not gonna happen. In this day, in this hour, we're gonna love everybody. We're not gonna bully anybody, but we're gonna disagree and that'll be called hate. And that's totally fine. I'm not bowing my knee to culture. I'm bowing my, my knee to Jesus. And I'm gonna declare the truth. It is the truth of God and his word that sets people free. Not your false empathy, not your feelings, the truth of God. Does that mean you can be mean? No, that's not what we're talking about. But no matter how nice you be or how you try to wrap it, uh, wrap it in a nice package, at the end of the day, you need to make a decision that you're going to honor God and not man because the future of generations and your soul, they depend on it. So what do we do with that? It's heavy. What do we do with that? Well, we need to have the mind of Christ. So what's the mind of Christ? It's actually a really simple message. The mind of Christ, uh, well, let me read it, chapter two, uh, being in verse five. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself. Everybody say humbled. And he became obedient. Everybody say obedient. obedient. To the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, not the ideology of the day, not the social pressures, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every knee will bow. Of those in heaven and on the earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what's the mind of Christ? Quickly, number one, a humble mind. The Bible says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. People that are proud think they know better than God. And if that's you, God is opposing you. But Jesus came that you would have life and life more abundantly. Even as a believer, if you profess Jesus, the Bible says that uh, those who love me are those who obey my commands. That means we can say that we love God, but Jesus even said there'll be people that cast out devils in my name, and when they come to me, I'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God in their life that can set them free. See, when you get out of the word, you get into deception. That's why the enemy is always saying, uh, getting, trying to get you to say, did God really say that instead of what did God say? 
This book is the living word of God, not a living document. It still sets people free. It's not defined by culture. It defines it. It's not an old book. It's a timeless book. It's eternal. And it can set you and I free today. But you have to make a decision that you're not going to elevate an ideology over your theology or what Jesus tells us to do. That we're not going to have the mind of culture that's permissive, that's proud, that's perverted, but we're going to have the mind of Christ, one that's humble and obedient to God. 1 Corinthians 6, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? Don't fool yourself. Christian, you know what is right. Stop partnering with people to hell and claiming that it's good. Don't fool yourself. Those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or male uh, prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheap people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of heaven. And some of you were once like that, but you've been bought with a price by the blood of Jesus. You've been born again and set free. That's not who you are today. You don't have to obey your urges. You don't have to obey your attractions. You don't have to obey culture. You can obey the living God who will set your feet upon a rock. And when the storms of life came and the persecutions all around you, because you're not following in with the propaganda of our day, there will be people that will see you and they'll see the power and the spirit and the presence of God in your life and it will set them free. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Today's Pentecost Sunday, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, going into heaven, Holy Spirit came in that early church. It was fearful, they were afraid. They knew if they came out and said the name of Jesus, Culture didn't like what Jesus said. People say, well, Jesus didn't really say anything about all those things. Jesus said, I, 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 I fulfill all the law and the prophets. Not one item will be removed from the law. It doesn't mean you can live however you want. It means that you can live free from the power of sin so that you can live according to God's standards. God wants to fill you with the spirit today that you'd be someone that's bold. Someone whose name that will echo in eternity that you'll be rewarded for something more than just accumulating stuff. But you'll be crucified with Christ, as Paul said in Galatians. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I know we live in a culture that's just, it's a Disneyland culture. It's all about pleasure. It's hedonistic. But God has called us to be all about purpose and to turn to him. And I want to challenge you to turn to the truth. Truth is found. Your truth is irrelevant. It's not created. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you find him, you find everything. So to have the mind of Christ is simple. It's to be humble and to be obedient to God. Your mind, it matters. So the question is, do you have the mind of Christ? To the church in Corinth, Paul said, we have the mind of Christ. And as a church, I just want to remind you, I've talked about this a lot over the last two years. We'll be talking about a lot to the future because the sexualization of children and the antichrist spirit, the perverted mind, the proud mind, all these issues is not going away. And if you don't disciple your children, the world will. And if you're not in the word, then you'll pick up the, the, the deception of man. I'm gonna challenge you to have the mind of Christ. You can stand with me, Center County, here in the house as we close. I just want to mention before you give an opportunity to respond, I just want to tell you that we will not suppress the truth. We'll declare it. Jesus is that truth. We will teach because we believe in discipling nations. So when you disciple, you teach what Jesus taught in the Word of God. 
Gender is binary, male, female, the image of God. Marriage is a covenant between one man and one woman. Sexuality is a gift from God and should be celebrated in the context of biblical marriage. Life is sacred and should be protected, born and unborn. Politics needs God and God is the building block of society. And if God's word offends your politics on any level, then you repent of it and you turn to God. The church and the word of God is the building block, building block for uh, uh, society and human flourishing. Self should not be worshiped, but we should surrender and we should offer our lives as a living sacrifice to God. God wants to use you and I to rescue people from the fires of hell and a culture and a world that is quickly fading. Jesus is returning and he wants you and I full of his grace, full of his truth, full of his spirit, full of his power to arise and hold the standard, be repairs of the breach and declare the truth of God that sets people free. They'll say, they'll say you're, you're, you're a hater. You're a bigot. You're all these things. And make sure that you're not. But love people and share the truth because that alone is what sets people free. Say, how do you know that? Because as such were some of you, and so was I. And Jesus can do it in my heart and my life. He can do it in yours and yours in Center County and those of you watching online. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Not an easy message. I've wrestled with this uh, a lot this week. It's a necessary one. And I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you. Season two is going to be much worse than season one of the cultural revolution. And you and I have an opportunity to shine bright in the midst of darkness. No more cowardice, courage. Sharing the love of God and the truth of God because that is what sets people free. In Jesus' name. Come on, you receive the word today. <laughs> Pastor Josh is going to come in Center County. I want you to bow your heads with me. And uh, we're going to give you an opportunity right now to make Jesus the Lord of your life, to repent of your sin. That when you walk out of here, you can be filled with wisdom, the Spirit of God, and you can go about and fulfill God's plan and His purpose in your life. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Just want to give you the opportunity to to respond to this message here today. And the, the Bible says that all fall short of the glory of God. That when we continue to to walk in a cultural mindset, we're we're running from the mindset of Christ. And so, I want to encourage you here today that if you if you've never committed to follow Jesus, that today is your day. Maybe you've made that decision at one point in your life and you've chosen to kind of walk your your own path. And God's saying here today, today is the day to recommit to following him. And so if you're here today with every head bowed and every eye closed and you want to make that commitment to follow him, I'm just going to simply ask that you raise your hand. It's not to embarrass you. It's not to call you out, but it's to pray with you here today. It's the greatest decision that you could possibly make with your life as, as we repent of our, our wicked ways and we choose to follow God. So if that's you here today and you want to make that decision to follow Jesus, would you simply raise your hand? See your hand in the back. If you're joining us online, you can just simply write in the, uh, in the comments section. One of our amazing online hosts, they'll, they'll connect with you. But one more time here in the house, if you'd like to make that decision, that commitment or that recommitment to follow Jesus, would you simply raise your hand? And then come on, as a church family, would you just repeat this prayer after me? Would you just say, Dear Jesus, today I choose to follow you. Forgive me of my past. Wash me and make me new. Today, I'm a child of God, forgiven and free. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, let's celebrate with all those who made that decision here today. The Bible says that all of heaven is rejoicing, and so we're just joining in that party here today. And Hey, thanks for tuning in to our online experience. It's our prayer that you experience the freedom and life that only God has to offer. If you have a prayer request or a question, 
go ahead and drop us a line. Email us at hope at freedom.life. And if this message blessed you, share it on social media, send it to a friend, be a hope dealer. And again, thanks for tuning in. And we believe in your life, the best is still yet to come.